All right, in this Regents Chemistry video, we're going to go through questions 18 through 24 of the January 2013 Regents. Uh, so looking at this first question here, it asks us which compound is soluble in water. Uh, we just have to look here at table F in the reference table. So table F tells us about all these solubility rules. Uh, so over on the left side here, uh, my face is kind of blocking it, but we have uh, the soluble compounds. And then over on the right here, we have the insoluble compound. So uh, looking at this, this soluble uh, column here, we have group 1 ions. So this is very important to know that anything group 1 is going to be soluble. And there's no exceptions to this rule. So this is the most important rule to know. If you know that anything group 1 is soluble, then anytime you see any compound that has a group 1 ion in it, you already know that it's automatically soluble. Uh, whereas if we look at some of these insoluble rules, they all have exceptions. But if you notice, the common exception here is group 1, group 1, group 1, group 1, right? So anything that's group 1 is an exception to the insoluble rule because anything that's group 1 is always soluble with no exceptions. So looking at this question here, uh, we know uh, right off the bat the answer is going to be number 3 because sodium here is a group 1 ion. So if it has group 1, that means it's going to be soluble. The question asks which compound was soluble. Uh, these are all sulfide compounds, and then if we look at the insoluble chart, sulfides are insoluble, and the only uh, exception that you're given here is group 1 uh, or ammonium as an exception to that rule. So group 1, always soluble, that's a very important solubility rule to know. So looking at 19 then, uh, what is going to be different or the same uh, between a 26 gram sample of NaCl and a 52 gram sample? So these are both the same compound, NaCl. They're both the same phase, they're a solid. So are they gonna have a different density? No, they're gonna have the same because they're at the same temperature here. It's the same compound in the same phase. It's gonna have the same density. Is it gonna have a different gram formula mass? No, that's not gonna be true either because the gram formula mass tells us how many grams are in a mole. We would just look at the periodic table and see what the mass of sodium is, what the mass of chlorine is, and add them up and that would give us the formula mass for NaCl. That's not going to change based on how much we have. That's purely based on uh, the atomic mass of each element in the periodic table. So, so far, one and true, one and two are both out. Uh, and then looking at three, are they going to have the same chemical properties? Well, this is the same substance. It's the same substance. All we did was change the amount from 26 to 52 grams. So the same substance is going to have the same chemical properties. It's at the same temperature. Everything is the same except for the amount that we have. Now, are they going to have the same volume? That's not going to be true because you can kind of just imagine we have more NaCl here. You can imagine just a pile of this salt, right? Let's say we have a 26 gram pile and then we have a 52 gram pile, we'd have twice as much of it, right? So the volume would be bigger. Uh, so it wouldn't have the same volume, making the answer to number 19, uh, 3. Looking at 20, a gas changes to directly to a solid during which phase change? Uh, so actually, we're not even given all phase changes as answer choices here. If we look at uh, uh, saponification and decomposition, these are uh, actually types of reactions, as is fusion. Uh, well, actually, fusion can also be describing uh, the melting process, so we'll, we'll count that as both a, a phase change and a nuclear reaction. But uh, looking at the answer choices here, going from gas to solid is the phase change of deposition. So remembering our phase changes here, if we have solid, liquid, and gas, you want to be able to know all the uh, transitions here between uh, each of the uh, phases. So if we have solid to liquid, that would be called melting. Uh, liquid to solid, that would be called freezing. If we have liquid to gas, that would be called boiling. And then gas to liquid would be called condensation. And the boiling here we could also call evaporation. It's describing the same process there, going from liquid to gas. And then the two lesser known phase changes, going from solid uh, directly to gas, that's called uh, sublimation. So we talked about in that, that in class, sublimation. And then going from gas to solid, that's what this question asks, this is called deposition. So you got to be able to know all of the different phase changes here. This is something very basic that you'll you definitely need to know uh, for the Regents exam. Uh, so the answer here again is 2. Looking at 21, what does not determine uh, the phase of a substance. So uh, the arrangement of molecules, well that determines the phase because like we've talked about in class with these phase diagrams, if we have a solid, uh, a solid is going to be more rigidly arranged, 
a liquid is going to be a little less rigidly arranged, and a gas is going to be really spread out. Well, <laughs> kind of made these molecules bigger. They're not supposed to be, but they're supposed to be farther apart, spread out, moving around a lot faster. So the arrangement of molecules does actually uh, influence the phase, the phase because, uh, as we just sh showed here, the arrangement of molecules is different uh, for the three phases. The intermolecular forces are also going to determine the phase because in a solid we have a lot tighter, stronger forces holding these molecules together. Whereas in a gas we have uh, a lot weaker forces of attraction, uh, so those intermolecular forces do impact the phase. The number of molecules, that is not going to uh, determine the phase because how much of it you have doesn't, doesn't matter. We could have, uh, if we're looking at water here, we could have a small amount of ice, a large amount of ice. Uh, we could have a small amount of liquid water or a large amount of liquid water. Uh, the number of molecules does not uh, determine uh, the phase. That just determines how much of it you have. And I'm looking at four, uh, the molecular structure, again, uh, if something is more uh, a structure like water in the liquid phase, it's going to have that hydrogen bonding. Uh, in the solid phase, it's going to have more of a uh, crystalline structure. So uh, water's uh, shape uh, that determines this hydrogen bonding and, this, and the structures that it form in each phase are actually going to uh, impact the phase of a molecular substance. Uh, so the answer again here would be three. Okay, looking at 22 here. Which atom has the weakest attraction for electrons in a chemical bond? Uh, so the definition here that uh, we need for this question is attraction for electrons. This would be electronegativity, and I'll abbreviate it EN. But uh, electronegativity is, by definition, the attraction for electrons. So if we look at all of these, uh, right off the bat, you should know, hopefully, that fluorine is the most electronegative atom in the book. Uh, it has an electronegativity of 4.0. Uh, nitrogen is pretty high up there as well, but again, fluorine is the highest, absolutely. And so fluorine would be... Uh, sorry, I actually did this backwards. Uh, so I said the weakest attraction for electrons in a chemical bond. So it's definitely not going to be fluorine because fluorine is the highest. Uh, nitrogen is also pretty high up there as well. Uh, really what you want to use here is the trend in electronegativity. Electronegativity increases up and to the right on the periodic table. So we want to basically for the weakest attraction, the smallest electronegativity, we want to pick the atom that's closer uh, to the bottom left of the periodic table here. So then looking at our periodic table, uh, down here we have uh, barium, uh, calcium was an answer choice, so calcium, and then uh, boron over here. So our four choices here were boron, nitrogen, and fluorine. So the trend in electronegativity, as we saw here, is that it increases up and to the right. So these are all going to have a much higher electronegativity than calcium, which is further to the left, which would make its electronegativity smaller. So the correct answer here would be uh, calcium choice two. So for question 23, which statement describes a chemical reaction at equilibrium? So equilibrium, like we talked about, is going to be uh, when the rate of the forward reaction equals the rate of the reverse reaction. So basically, uh, the reaction is going as much to the right as it is to the left. The, the rate is the same. So it's not uh, moving overall in one direction because it's moving as much to the right, as quickly to the right as it is to the left. Uh, so the products are not completely consumed, the, reaction are, the reactants are not completely cons consumed because that would mean the reaction would go only in one direction. If the reactants are completely consumed, that would mean the reaction goes all the way to the right. If the products are completely consumed, that would mean it goes all the way to the left. But at equilibrium, we're having a balance here in between the forward and the reverse reactions. So then, uh, looking at choices three and four, the concentrations of the products and reactants are equal. That's not necessarily true in an equilibrium state. It just is, again, we're saying that uh, the rates of the forward and reverse reaction are the same, not necessarily the amounts of the compounds. So the concentrations of the products and reactants are constant. So this is going to be the answer choice here because, because the forward and the reverse reaction are going at the same rate, uh, there's no increase in the products because for every bit that we're going forward, we're going backwards an equal amount. So the products, if we make some more, we're using them up. Uh, in the reverse reaction at an equal rate. So the amount of products is going to stay the same. And same thing for the reactants. If we make some more reactants by doing the reverse reaction, we're going to use them up by doing the forward reaction. Because these are happening at the same rate, we're not going to make products or reactants um, because, the again, if the rates are the same, then the concentrations of the 
uh, reactants and the products are going to remain constant. And the last one here, looking at number 24, uh, which element bonds in rings and networks? Uh, this would be carbon here. Uh, so if we look at these types of bonding, aluminum is going to have uh, metallic bonding. Uh, so metallic bonding, we said, is that sea of mobile electrons where we have uh, you know, the, the nuclei of all of these atoms and we have the electrons in there. They're kind of free to, to roam around in here. Uh, this is metallic bonding, again, that sea of mobile electrons model. Uh, hydrogen and oxygen here, uh, they're going to be bonded to each other. Those are both diatomic elements. So these are going to have covalent bonding between each other. Carbon is not diatomic. So carbon, uh, one of the things that you might know about carbon is that it has a lot of different allotropes. Uh, so graphite is a form of carbon. Graphene is a form of carbon. Uh, coal is uh, mostly carbon-based as well. So uh, one of the things that you want to know about carbon is that it can do this network bonding. So graphene actually is this form uh, where all these little hexagons of carbon uh, kind of form this chain and it ends up looking a little bit like a honeycomb but it's really just a sheet of these uh, of this hexagon type network uh, so this is one uh, form of so this would again form a network of, of carbon uh, so that each of these points here would be a carbon atom uh, and again carbon could also form rings we've talked about uh, in organic chemistry we have uh, benzene which is a bunch of carbon, it's actually a hydrocarbon, but uh, carbon could bind, bond together in this ring uh, that also has the hydrogen atoms in it. Uh, but so you should just know this as a quality of carbon, uh, or a characteristic of carbon, that it can bond in networks such as graphene or in rings such as something like benzene. Uh, even graphene would be, uh, we're making rings here, these hexagonal rings uh, for carbon. Uh, so that's it for 18 through 24. Uh, the next video, uh, we'll keep going with the same old Regents exam. I'll see you in the next video.